Uh, thanks for coming. Um, well, uh, for, uh, many of you have been here before, but for those of you who have not, uh, you're in Studio X NYC. Uh, it's to make a long story short, we're an off-campus space run by the architecture department at Columbia. And uh, we do events such as tonight, and um, we've had a, a pretty busy week already, and um, it, it only continues. Uh, last night we had uh, Victoria Henshaw from the University of Manchester who was here uh, speaking about obviously the relationship between smell and the city. Um, it was pretty fascinating uh, learning about uh, all the kind of minor urban design tricks that one can do to uh, change the landscape of, of, of a given metropolis. And um, we should have that online uh, relatively soon. Um, and then on Friday we've got this thing called Dredge Fest. Um, we're, we're trying to compete with the Oz Fest, but uh, we're doing it in the form of artificial sediment removal. And um, it's uh, four guys, I believe now is the, is the, is the group. They're called the uh, uh, Dredge Research Collaborative, or something, something or other. But um, so in any case, they're on all day Friday, we're going to be speaking with um, people from the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, architects, uh, landscape architects, and some theorists about basically what, what, what Dredge is and sort of um, uh, augmented geological forms that, that make a city uh, uh, function and uh, create the artificial islands that we have around uh, New York City there. And then on Saturday we've got a book tour. Um, it's a it's a ticketed book tour, but I do, I do believe there are uh, tickets left. And um, that's all day on Saturday. It's from one to I think about six p.m. And uh, we're going to be uh, going around with um, many of the speakers from Friday, uh, giving sort of a tour of the harbor and uh, seeing New York City from a side that very few people get to see it. So this should be pretty exciting. Um, in any case, uh, so tonight we're here for a book, the book launch of a Future Practice uh, with Rory and Hyde. Um, this is actually the second time we've hosted Rory in the last six months or so. Um, he was here in the spring, and um, we'll have to bring you back next spring and you can, you can set a studio X record. Uh, it's a really exciting book, and uh, I'm really, uh, you know, congratulations to Rory for, for, for seeing it through. Um, he'll tell you much more about it, but um, it was exciting that basically there was, uh, or at least my understanding is that there was a, a blog post that Rory wrote, let's say, what, about a year and a half ago? Um, that generated a huge, huge amount of uh, discussion online. It was about the, the, the future possible uh, practice that an architect could engage in. Um, what is the role of the architect? What can architects do uh, beyond merely uh, stylizing a building or even working on buildings at all? Um, what are the, the types of things that architectural training open up for people to do? Uh, and how can one engage in the architectural collection or the architectural industry in, in, a, in, a, in a way that uh, kickstarts different types of ideas and, and practices? So uh, in any case, that, that snowballed into the book, um, which, is, which is great. And on sale in the back there through McNally Jackson, so definitely pick up a copy if, if, if you can. Um, the format for tonight will be uh, Rory uh, giving an introduction to the book. Um, I think that'll be 20, 25 minutes or so. Then we'll do a brief Q&A between the two of us and then throw it up to you guys. And um, at that point then, feel free just to hang out, uh, drink some wine, which is up there in case you haven't seen it yet, and uh, meet the man himself and uh, pick up a book, etc. So uh, with no further ado, I will leave it at that. And thanks for Rory. Thank you, Jeff. Um, all right, so I guess what I'm doing today then is um, uh, it's a two-part lecture. Uh, first half is, the, is a sort of narrative on the decline of the architect, um, how we got to today, um, and why we might be in this scenario that we're in. Um, and then the second half is a kind of um, summary of strategies which come out of the interviews in the book. Um, there are 17 interviews uh, with people which I'm saying are on the edge of architecture. Um, not all of them are architects. Um, some of them come from policy or education or from activism or from history or research. Um, and I'm just going to select uh, three or four of the interviews and kind of unravel the strategies that they're using. Um, so let's go. Crisis. Um, the world today is defined by a continual crisis. Uh, Iranian youth crisis, earthquake, banana crisis. That was in Australia a year ago. But more people bought more bananas during the banana crisis because there was a kind of fever. Um, Eurozone crisis, youth crisis, crisis of identity, etc. And meanwhile, um, architects are having their own crisis of relevance. Um, we complain of marginalization from the process of real decision making, of being treated like cake decorators only interested in styling, of being undervalued financially, over-regulated, too exposed to the instability of the market and more. Um, this crisis is very real. Uh, this is just a 
small sampling from two minutes on the web and um, a newspaper I saw last week in London. Um, architects are unemployed. They're, it's the New York Times says, "What a job! Go to college, don't major in architecture." That's the advice for new graduates. Which, as a new graduate, is kind of like, okay. Um, and this guy is in a similar position. We love it. This is the kind of scenario in many offices. Um, that, that could be a photo from MBIDB, uh where I used to work. Lots of people with advanced degrees, masters, PhDs, hunched over um, wire cutters. This is David Chipperfield. It's also having an effect at the top. Some might call him a star architect. Um, he feels more impotent in doing really, in really doing things, having any real effect on the world we live in. And I just saw this one in the new wallpaper as well. Speaking of effect at the top, this is um, Ola Sheeran, who's a partner of Ola May, uh, or was rather in their China office. Um, this is a commissioned photo, so this is him at the center. Um, and as you can see, the, the staff surrounding is just complete chaos. You can sort of make out the image, but these are um, like drips, hospital drips. And they they seem to wear either pajamas, which would suggest that they've been there all night, or like prison clothes, meaning they can't leave. So either way you interpret this, um, image, even for the real stars, it's, it's hard work at the top. Um, oh, this is just a, this is to kind of involve me. This is my last night at NBIDB after three weeks of eating dinner in the office. <laughs> and I'm so happy because it's my last night. <laughs> um, it didn't used to always be this way. This is the, um, this is the proposal for the south of Amsterdam by um, Berlaga. Uh, this is when architects were at the center of the action. So this is 1917. Um, a huge section of city um, integrated with schools and transport and um, public buildings and entertainment and shops. It, the architect as um, shaper of social being. This is a kind of sample of the type of attitude that, that it takes to build a city like that. So these two statues are built as part of this plan. Um, on the left is the female, on the right is the male. They're on either side of the bridge. Um, you can see the mother is teaching the daughter um, about peace. There's a dove engraved in the base of this. And the um, man is teaching the boy about industry. There's cogs and batteries and um, weights there. So it's kind of... Um, you know, what kind of a society can build this sort of a sculpture with a straight face today um, where you really think about the next generation, where you really uh, build into the fabric a kind of uh, generous social contract. So we used to have all the answers. This is um, shortly after, in the 20s. Cabuzier's famous uh, sweep of the hand um, over his bill radius for Paris. The bright, clean, uh, modernist future, which was uh, frustratingly unrealized for Camusier, but which after World War II became the kind of default uh, model on which all social housing and new districts were based. So, this is the builder, uh, which is also an asset. Um, bright, clean housing surrounded by parkland, um, the, the, the future vision realized. Um, of course, these ambitions didn't always succeed. Um, like much of the French uh, Bandeleu and once much of the Prude Ego, which I guess is the American um, example of choice of the um, unfulfilled uh, social housing. This is the um, this is the plane crash that happened in much a bit later, 1992. Um, by that stage, the um, bright, clean, modernist buildings had become um, full of crime and um, disease. Uh, and although the plane crash is unrelated, it, 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 in the minds of Amsterdam, it kind of seemed like a, 
um, a bad owner related to the status of these of these buildings. And so after that, they've partially been torn down or, or um, radically renovated. Valtman Stippout, who's one of the people I interview in the book, asks, can we blame the architect for the you know, even part of the depravity, part of the social unrest, part, uh, even part of the um, you know, political problems that these kinds of buildings brought? And um, his response is, well, if architects can claim to um, generate social um, you know, positive social outcomes, then surely we can also be blamed. So it's a, it's a two-sided coin. Um, so I, th I think in, in one way or another we did take responsibility. Um, we retreated after the, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we retreated into the avant-garde, so we, we created um, you know, speculative visions for ourselves and for our peers um, that contributed a little. Um, being, bombastic and simplistic here for the sake of an argument. There's obviously a lot to get, get out of Super Studio. Um, and we also retreated into commerce where we just followed the market. We let um, developers tell us what was needed um, and we threw off our social ambitions. We left them behind. This is, although th that wasn't a necessarily a safe refuge, um, this is a photo from Dubai Cityscape. This is, his name's Clyde, it says so on his side. He's a uh, senior project manager with experience in mega projects. Um, lost his job in the crisis. Now the popular response to this has been to get busy, to um, you know, you work with our hands to build um, urban farms, to build uh, pop-up restaurants, to build bars, to build dumpster pools, to um, green roofs, to build, uh, I don't know, skate parks, to, to get involved in the community, to not sit on our hands um, and become part of the solution. And while all this enthusiasm is fantastic, I, I do get the sense that at the moment when, we, when we're facing the greatest challenge, our solution is at its most polite. So this is the kind of scenario we're at um, as architects. This is a drawing um, that Marty Kalia, who's a Finnish architect, has done. Um, the traditional architectural office is this uh, shrinking iceberg in the centre. And these new territories uh, popping up around it are the kind of um, invading hordes of education, technology, government, um, new models of practice, communications, other disciplines which um, are increasingly taking on the role of architects. So what's to be done? This is the kind of flip, so we, we enter stage two, halfway point, grab a drink. <laughs> <laughs> the book is looking at the edge of the iceberg. So this is um, Liam Young and his uh, troop of um, AA students standing literally on the edge of the iceberg in um, Alaska as part of their unknown fields division research trips. Um, he's interviewed in the book about new models of education and, and new ways of thinking about the environment. Um, part two. So I guess the argument, the meta argument that comes through um, through all of the um, interviews is that we need to get back into the real game, um, the big game of economy, of strategy, of large scales, of politics, of vision and of integration. Um, and we need to become, you know, return to being the profession that has the answers rather than the ones that do the gardening. Um, so I guess the this word on the cover, the future, is used in the sense of, in the William Gibson sense of the word future, in that um, it's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So it's already here in the sense that the people interviewed in the book or the people doing this work um, are real, they're um, out there, they're um, doing it now, and they may not be in the mainstream, but I'm suggesting that they're they offer uh, potential futures or potential paths forward um, away from this 
uh, idea of the traditional architect who leans back in his chair waiting for the telephone to ring for somebody to invite him to do a nice new building. Um, so the book is structured around a series of new roles, um, and these might be the potential features, and they're mapped onto uh, the real people. Um, Dan Hill, who contributed the um, introduction and the foreword, he looked at this idea of the edge and, and kind of divided the interviewees into um, sort of three camps. So you have the people on the side of architecture um, on the bottom left here. You have the people who are non architects kind of looking back in or interested in this idea of urbanism. And then you have the people who are actually on the edge, so who could go either way or um, work in the multidisciplinary ways. Um, and I'm going to look at four up the line here Marcus Westbury, um, who's started in the new Newcastle, Robin Boyd, who's an Australian architect um, and from the 60s and who operated in the 50s and 60s. Uh, I think offers a good model for how to use uh, the media as an architect. Uh, Jeannie Gang, who's a um, Chicago-based architect um, working in, on very large-scale um, complex projects. Indy Yoha, who's a uh, British architect, again interested in economy. So let's go. The first model is the civic entrepreneur, um, Indy Yoha. Zero, zero is his practice. He's put together this book, which is called The Companion for the Civic Economy. Um, and he describes this idea of the civic economy as how technology and the deep democratization of the process is offering a new way for people to organize themselves locally and to create institutions and organizations which are fundamentally focused on a civic purpose. Um, so what that means in practice is um, this is one of their projects, which is called the Scale Free School. So instead of building a new school where you, you know, buy a big block of land, you put in an oval, you uh, build a school house, you, uh, you know, build a staff canteen, you build a um, cafeteria for all the students. Their proposal for Marlborough in um, outside of London is to canvas the city to find out what buildings are available, what buildings are underutilized, um, and what schedules are available. Uh, and then basically piece together a school within the existing infrastructure of the city, including um, public sports fields, public swimming pools, um, students get vouchers to use in restaurants or cafes in the city, um, and they use public halls or um, the public library. And so with no capital expenditure up front, they've created a school out of nothing, effectively. Um, the school becomes the stuff that connects the school together. So. Uh, mobile phones which tell you your, um, your schedule, which can be updated uh, on, the, on the fly. Student cards um, to validate the students' uniforms basically become the, the identity of this distributed school, um, you know, and then all the rest. Another project of theirs is called Wiki House. Um, it's effectively a, a catalog of um, joints. It's a catalogue of uh, structures that you can cut yourself out of plywood using CAD CAM um, and assemble your own structures. So again, it's, a, it's about democratising design, um, and he calls it a poem for the future, um, a way of you know, uh, spreading this design and making in, in beyond architects and professionals into the public. Um, and this is my favorite example of the civic economy. Uh, I mean, this is probably the, the best, um, co the biggest contrast with this urban farming stuff. So this is a um, town called Fitchery, which is in the north of England. Um, and there was an energy company proposing to build a wind farm of their, um, near, near to their town, an, an array of 20 or so, um, you know, pylons. And normally what these towns do is oppose these things, they, the NIMBYs kick in, they try and fight these developments um, because of the way they look on the horizon. Um, instead this town turned around and they formed their own energy company. So of the town of 500, 150 people bought into this idea. They approached the energy company as a non-profit 
to purchase one of the um, turbines, or rather to build an extra one for the town itself. So these, this town owns a uh, wind turbine, and all the money that comes out of that is then put back into um, improving the energy efficiency of all their homes. Um, they, they've built new sports facilities, they've built new, um, they've improved their town hall, and basically this is a kind of cash cow that's going to keep on giving as long as the wind is turning. And it's such a great example of how a community can think bigger and really engage in the sort of real um, scale of energy and of um, economy. Now, scale is another sort of big aspect that um, I think architects need to reclaim. Um, this interview in the book is with Rene de Graaf, who's a partner of uh, OMA and runs their, their research division, um, AMO, in Rotterdam. Um, I guess their sort of breakout project was, the, was this research project on the idea of Europe, which was all in an exhibition and in a new branding, or a new flag, rather, for um, Europe, which was um, a, all the European flags kind of stacked together. So it was a um, flexible model of the identity of Europe as, they, as it collects new countries, if that makes sense. So all these stripes here on this tent are squashed European flags. So that looks like Greece. Uh, that looks like Spain, maybe. Um, and in terms of thinking on a large scale, this is their project for um, rethinking the way Europe produces um, renewable energy. So they redrew the map based on um, the sort of natural occurrences of um, renewable energy. So um, up here, the uh, east coast of England and Scotland becomes the Isles of Wind along sections of Norway. Um, this northern part of Germany becomes geothermalia, which is um, appropriate for geothermal energy. Um, Solaria is in the south in Spain, where it's best to use um, solar energy. Um, and at, at the moment, they would say that this model is inverse. Um, the, all the solar panels are in Germany, where it's not very sunny, and that we should put them down here, create a massive energy grid at the European scale, um, and share all that energy. And, According to their figures, within um, 50 years, Europe can go to being energy neutral, especially with the inclusion of Northern Africa, which would generate so much solar energy for the energy intensive winter months. So that's their kind of, and that, which has some incredible political um, associations as well, which means Africa would have to join the European Union, which I find nicely controversial. Um, and then for, for a project which was commissioned by the World Wildlife Fund, they then extended this um, idea of the global energy grid across the earth, which immediately becomes uh, but with the full of map from 50 years ago. So this, this whole earth scale thinking um, is very much back, and I think that, uh, well, they would argue that architects are in a pretty good position to do that. And just to, again, to return to this idea of the, um, of the, of the post-war and the role that architects used to play, this is some photos from their current exhibition as part of the Venice Biennale called uh, Public Works. And it looks at the, um, the, what they call the faceless, nameless government architects. So these guys are effectively bureaucrats. They worked in um, government offices in London, in Holland, um, as part of the government department, which then also designed buildings. So, so that some of their better known work is, um, I guess, South Bank in London, this you know, brutalist uh, beast that sits along the Thames there. And this is a um, this is a photo of the Undercroft showing how it's been, you know, adapted over, over time. Um, and this quote, which is also uh, from the book, Renier talks about um, the architect didn't have this voluntary self-confinement to the scale of the building. So they, they were brave enough to think of the scale of the city or the scale of the nation. Um, and because they worked directly for the government, social values were also at their core. 
So there's a, there's a pretty powerful statement being made here by these guys presenting this exhibition today, um, at the very moment when the um, welfare states of Europe are being dismantled, and um, we're a long way from a time when governments used to have um, in-house actors. Now, next, professional generalist um, is the genie game. Um, and this comes out of the idea that the architect um, on, the, on a typical building project is the kind of coordinator of various trades and professions. So they, they need to take the engineer's drawings, understand them, feed them into the building. They need to talk to lift people, landscape architects, councils, um, planning departments. They, in a way, they know just through the course of doing a project, architects tend to know a little bit about a lot of things, and that kind of becomes their job. Um, and Jeannie's point of view is to apply that logic to different types of projects, so not just building projects, but um, projects which might be on the scale of the city or, or might be more environmental in nature or ecological in nature. So to get to, I've got one example here of one of doing projects, and to get there we need to go back. So this is, um, this is a photo of the digging of the Calumet feeder um, out of Chicago um, in 1914, um, at a time when Chicago's sewerage just went straight into the, um, oh God, what's the name of it? Lake Michigan. And they, in all their infinite wisdom, the um, engineers decided to dig new canals which would uh, cross over, you can see in this diagram, this is the subcontinental divide, so you have one watershed here, one watershed here, Chicago sits here. They created new um, canal, uh, canals to pump their sewage into the Mississippi and therefore become some other state or city's problem, which worked great for a while, except then you have this um, new problem of invasive species. This is the Asian carp, which has been making its way up the Mississippi and is imminently about to cross into Lake Michigan and they've been building these um, electric barriers um, to stun, stun the fish, but they're just everywhere. If you drive a, they also jump out of the water in response to uh, vibrations. This has been in the news a lot. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's a, this is the kind of um, consequence of some short-sighted thinking 120 years ago is, is now a very real threat to your fishing tackle. Um, and Jeannie's response to this is to, I mean, that kind of a problem, which is so multi-layered, um, it's to do with um, ecology, watersheds, um, species invasion, um, you know, she had to deal with the military to have uh, jurisdiction over the um, security of the waterways. And, her, and she describes her role as um, being a translator or integrator and about which persons you put in the same room together. So just a, a kind of coordinator of expertise to um, put them around the same table and then to um, use that as a platform to uh, hopefully lead to new answers. Um, and this is one of the proposals that she's um, come up with with her students at Harvard um, and at IMT and also through her research through her studio. Um, it's, it's using this new water barrier to create a whole new ecology and open up a whole new section of um, Chicago. So it, with, it, it effectively takes all these diverse expertise and wraps it together, um, integrates it into one cohesive plan. And I, and I think that's, the, that's increasingly what we'll see architects um, doing in the future is, is not making these kind of industrial style. Um, I mean, Le Corbusier's uh, gesture to wipe Paris clean and build his towers is the same as these um, engineers saying we need to get rid of the sewage through these canals. It's a, it's a single-minded um, response to a single problem. Um, what, the, what a project like this, even though it looks equally large in scale, and I think that's good, but it's informed by so many different levels of expertise that, it, that it's not, it's no longer a, it's no longer equal, I guess is the, is the word. Um, two to go. 
with this is a um, and Craig Olsen's just walked in, who's an advisor on the um, on Renew Newcastle, uh, which is projected by Marcus Westbury uh, in Newcastle, Australia. Um, I've, for the purpose of this, I've, I've bundled him under the community enabler, which he is in the book, but also strategic designer because I think it, um, his role is as much that as anything else. Um, again, we have to begin by going back. This is Hunter Street, a bustling um, centre strip in the city of Newcastle in uh, New South Wales, um, near Sydney. Uh, it used to be the heart of the town um, at a time when it was a um, booming uh, centre of industry um, and with a growing population, all the rest. Um, this is the same street today. It's practically empty, um, but it, you know, as a result of declining industry and new big box stores built on the um, periphery of town, um, which has forced all these traders to move out. It's no longer the heart that it used to be. Um, what um, the, the trouble is, as Marcus identified, um, Marcus is a, his background is, he's not an architect, his background is in organising large arts festivals. So, so I got to know him maybe 10 years ago when he was uh, running a festival called Next Wave in Melbourne. He's just really good at knowing how to get, you know, extract people's enthusiasm and funnel it into a way that's um, you know, beneficial for everybody. Um, so he's a native Newcastle boy. Um, saw this, you know, the sort of depressingness of, of his town um, getting further and further away from what he remembered, um, and yet saw this incredible um, enthusiasm and creativity happening in people's um, back sheds or in their living room. And yet there's this main street which, which is full of empty shops. So you know, how do you get those two things together? The, the, shop, the building owners don't want to let these um, creatives in because they don't pay enough insurance or they don't pay, um, you know, what if a uh, you know, full paying person came along and, they, and there's some hat maker in there? You know, how do you avoid this scenario? Um, and in the meantime, the, the um, the local council, the local government had spent millions on repaving the plaza, as you can see, putting new street trees in, um, new seats, and you know, as, a, as a way to, they'd be using architecture or space or landscape as a way to try and attract businesses back to this place, which is done um, next to nothing, according to Marcus. So, uh, Marcus's strategy, well, the strategy of the new Newcastle and the other um, and his partners there is to develop a new um, tenancy agreement um, and also to form a non for profit which acts as a guarantor. This is, as I understand it, acts as a guarantor. So it allows um, these creatives to move in with a, with a nominally um, low amount of rent, effectively occupying unoccupied space. Um, they then can use their own energy to fix it up. Um, this is one of the earlier projects um, uh, an empty shop front smashed in window is turned into a Vox Cyclops, the um, independent record store. Um, this, on, at that scale, uh, they've turned around dozens of, um, of empty tenancies in the same way. This is a map of all their projects. Um, and according to Marcus, that cumulative effect has effectively turned around the street. It's now a bustling hub. He said, if you show this um, photo to a native uh, Nova Castrian, they don't believe it. They think this is a Photoshop image of Hunter Street Mall. That there, it's not possible that there will be so many people there. So, um, effectively, as he described it, by lowering the barrier of entry to what you can do, you can organically generate some of the structured outcomes which have failed to manifest despite all the resources thrown in, in the world. And Marcus has managed to turn this idea into a kind of um, consultancy. So he's now advising um, dozens of cities around Australia and um, even around the world on how they can implement these new, um, effectively, it's a, it's a legal document. It's, the, the intervention here is not spatial at all. It's just a um, you know, contract which he's opened up. Um, but the results are incredibly architectural, so that's why I'm really interested in this, um, because the, the 
scale of intervention is so um, distant from the um, success of the outcome. All right. Oh, and that's a, that's a um, at that point you have to put in this quote, which is the Cedric Price's catch line um, when um, he was approached by a, a uh, couple who spent to design a new house, um, who spent the entire time arguing um, throughout the meeting, and his response was to turn down the commission and to tell them that they need instead a divorce. And it's, which is kind of funny because it shows, on the one hand, the limits of architecture, even a good house won't fix your marriage. Um, but also, it's, it shows a kind of you know, thinking beyond space as a solution for a problem. So, in, in, in the same way as Marcus used the legal document, Cedric Price is endorsing the um, courts as a way to solve this architectural question. <laughs> And finally, um, this is my kind of a hero, and many architects from Melbourne's hero, Ron Boyd, um, who I'm calling a model for the architect as public intellectual. I'll try to be quick because I've spoken for too long. Um, this is the final example. Uh, Boyd was um, practicing mainly in the 50s and 60s. Um, there's the man there. Uh, he was a, you know, Cracking architect on, on his own terms. This is a house he designed for um, furniture designers, Brad and Mary Featherston, which is, which is described as living in a garden. So um, the various rooms are just platforms within a, within a large body. Um, he had an international profile at, at the, in the period where it took five stops on a jet to go from Australia to Europe. This is him giving Walter Caribbean a tour around Melbourne with some other um, students. And he was a prolific and um, unflinching social critic. So this is his um, popular hit, The Australian Ugliness, which um, was a, 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 a uh, brutal dissection of the, um, the suburban style of post-war Australia. Um, where you chop down the nice old trees to make way for um, telephone poles and uh, dress up buildings with stuff on ornament, which he called featureism. Um, they were fighting the battle for modernism. Um, and this is the project which I'm really um, fascinated in. It's what's called the Small Home Service, which was um, <coughs> sponsored by the Age newspaper, which is the major newspaper in Melbourne. Um, what it was, uh, they sponsored a small studio which designed a new house every week. Uh, Boyd was given a column in the, in the newspaper with which he used to promote the new house. So um, each week they would design a new house, he would promote it through the column. You could buy the full set of plans um, for that house for five pounds from the newspaper, which is equivalent to, I don't know, fifty dollars today. Um, you could then give that to a builder and they could build the home on your new suburban block. They sold um, 50,000 uh, well, 50, homes were built from those plans um, and they in turn influenced another 150,000 which is you know, where a builder will copy another design. Um, Boyd estimates that at the time that it was running 40% of new homes were, were built with these plans. All were modern. All were um, info, you know, new design, cutting edge stuff. And it's just it's such a great example of how an architect can you know, take responsibility for the broader um, concerns of the public and really um, push an agenda in a constructive way. So that's it. My conclusion, I guess, comes back to Vernon. Make no little plans. Um, it's an appeal to have a braver position, a larger agenda, um, and not a larger agenda as formless, but a, um, as integrators, as visionaries, as economists, um, as understanding complex interactions, as integrating others' expertise, as getting in deep with the dark matter of bureaucracy, the media operating at large scale. Um, and I'm going to finish with two quotes which come from the book. The first is from Bruce Mao, uh, who says that if you think about architecture as a methodology, independent from the outcome, 
as agnostic from its product, you would see that Arctic did from synthesis informed by civic values. If you have that capacity, that's the most valuable capacity of this time in history. So he would argue if you zoom out from the actual application of our knowledge in designing buildings, we have the capacity to do much more. Finally, I'll give them the final word to Bout and Stip Out, who says, if an architect is humble, then what good are they? Thank you. Cool, thanks, Roy. Um, I just want to ask uh, one question and I'll throw it open to, to everyone. Um, but I guess uh, by way of sort of a brief anecdote, um, my, my own background uh, as an architecture writer um, uh, is actually in, in writing. Uh, I, I studied, um, of all things, interdisciplinary studies and then, and then art history, which is obviously a very useful degree. Um, and as an outsider looking into architecture, and the reason why I started writing about architecture at the time, which is a, um, yeah, a number of years ago, um, was out of actually, I don't want to say like um, professional or educational jealousy, it seemed like architects had these amazing degrees where you guys were prepared to, or not prepared, but you were trained to be able to not only make buildings, but you could do, you could work in the game industry, you could work in the film industry, you could do stage set design, you could do things in um, property development, you could work for the city for um, sort of urban administrations for everything from zoning to uh, infrastructure. And it seemed like this amazing degree that you could get that would prepare you to work in all of these fields and, and, and whatnot. So, um, almost out of like a, a fanboyism, I was sort of attracted to writing about architecture because I couldn't believe how um, well positioned you guys were to, to using you as kind of like the, the you guys um, to, to actually do things. Whereas, you know, here I actually in interdisciplinary studies, which meant I could like quote Derrida. Um, and so it's funny that uh, now, now actually being in architecture, and in fact teaching at Columbia, um, the thing that I find is really interesting is, is, um, is two things. Now that I'm um, in the educational kind of um, conveyor belt, I'm actually shocked at the things that are taught. They seem so irrelevant that I now understand why architects are um, frustrated and, and act this way. Um, or like as if there's this, uh, this crisis. But then the other thing is, is uh, what I thought was so funny is that all of the things that I was excited about in architecture, um, if you lurk on Archinect um, discussion boards or if you follow the comment sections on a lot of different architecture blogs, it's the very things that I thought architects were so optimistic about doing in all the industries that they could work in um, that are being, um, I don't know, like greeted with a, a genuine lack of enthusiasm. Uh, with, where you get people actually angry, you know, like I'm, I'm paying this amount of money to get a degree in architecture from Columbia and I have an art degree. Um, or, you know, I, I, I went to the Bartlett School of Architecture and it's, you know, the f five years of my life and I, but I don't want to be a game designer. You know, like I don't want to write fiction, I want to design things. You know? Um, so, in any case, I wonder if, um, if focusing on that kernel there of education, um, uh, not only maybe if there's an uh, exemplary interview in the book that maybe talks about education and how um, these sorts of things can either be teased out or amplified or augmented and, and who that might be in the book, but also just like as a personal question as someone who did not study architecture to someone who did, um, the types of things that you think might be missing in architecture, either to make people enthusiastic about the possibility, not, feel, not to feel denigrated that they're designing a video game for Assassin's Creed or something like that, but, and, and not to feel belittled, but to be excited to apply spatial thinking to different disciplines. How do you, how do you um, yeah, bring people into the educational process to make those sort of collaborations happen on a level that's not rejected? Yeah. Um, I think, the, I think the main problem is that we are indoctrinated with this um, social obligation. You know, we really are trained to believe that we can change the world and make it a better place. You know, and I think that, um, you know, you can, on the one hand, you might maybe, might not say that a computer game can do that. You know, uh, you, maybe you can say a computer game can do that, but there's a, there is a expectation or a hope that you'll you'll work on something that matters, <laughs> you know, something that's um, good and honest and pure that can um, you know make the world a better place. And the reality of um, architecture, as we've seen, you know that 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 kind of architecture really only existed for a very short window, perhaps in the post-war. And, I, and I, I haven't spoken to anybody who worked in those times, but I suspect it was not, not as rosy as we make it out to be today. And the reality of today is, is you graduate and you, um, and you go and you draw, um, you know, you click AutoCAD or you, um, you know, drawing 
bathroom layouts or endless revisions to stay up late and um, and that's when you're working, actually working on real, real buildings. You know, and even the even the real stuff is is somehow made to seem banal by the reality of work. I mean, maybe it's a. I think I do think we're spoiled by the by the education in a way, the expectations that are put on us. You know, I mean, quotes like that from from Bruce Mal, you know, is is kind of part of that. You know, we we have the capacity. This time in history, you know, there's, a, it's, you know, Bruce Mao would think that working on it. I asked him um, also in the interview if if it was enough if um, designers could just design, you know, and use the word just as in, you know, just make something look good. Is that enough? He said no. <laughs> That's not enough. You need to change the world. And I think that now that we're so, you know, out of work or um, unemployed or um, whatever it is, I mean, that helplessness has been brought to the forefront. And I guess that's what the book is trying to suggest, is that there's other ways to be helpful or other ways to, that your training can be applied outside of doing social architecture, like schools or, um, you know, uh, like hospitals. And so, yeah, I think I hope that answers the question in a way. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, I, I guess just one, one more quick question. If I lied, I said I had one. But um, I guess I'm for, also as a, as, a, as a writer, I think that one of the things that's interesting now is the there are a lot of arguments in architectural criticism where people say that the architectural critic is now irrelevant and you know deemed to be uh, excised from the, the newspaper and so on. Um, but I guess it's what what role would you say that? I mean, for instance, if you design an opera house, if you design a building for the 1%, you're going to get reviewed. You know, you're going to end up in the New York Times, you'll be in the New Yorker, Paul Goldberger will attend your the opening, etc. Um, but if you do design, you know, something for Assassin's Creed, you might get reviewed on, on Gizmodo or Boing Boing, but you're not, or The Verge for that matter, but you're not going to appear in sort of the major press. Um, I guess I'm just curious about how do you make architecture critics uh, write about either the financial aspects of a Marcus Westbury or the fictional kind of sci-fi speculation aspects of a Liam Young or the biotechnical aspects of somebody like Natalie Jeremijenko and to bring that into the architectural conversation or do you think that that's not necessarily the role of, of the architect to try to find the right critics and to find the right media outlets and to make sure that you realize that you can be validated by someone other than Paul Goldberg? Yeah, I think that's right. I'm, I'm not sure it's just to do with the Critics, I, I mean, I think it's a, um, I think it's a general conversation about the expansion of architecture. I mean, we're, we're all familiar. As, well, if you're an architect, you're familiar. You know, at a dinner party, someone will ask you. You'll say, "I'm an architect. Oh, what sort of buildings do you do? Houses or offices?" You know, that's the kind of question. And instead, of, you know, I say, "Well, I have a radio show. Um, I edit books. I um, teach, and I." Uh, do interviews, you know, <laughs> and then design houses, you know. But this idea, and, and for me, I would say all of that is architecture, you know. And Paul Goldberg is not going to be my radio show. Um, he's not going to read many of my books, probably either. But um, I don't know. I, I feel like that's that kind of a role for the critic um, is still a hangover of this idea that the architect is, a, is somebody who just designs buildings. And I guess the, the, what I'm trying to endorse in, through the book is that there's a, there's a broader spectrum of knowledge here, which is all architecture um, that can be applied in different ways in different contexts. Um, and yeah, perhaps it's going to take a while before there's a sort of critical platform for that stuff to be appreciated in, in parallel. Um, but it, at the moment, you know, there's... Um, Marcus Westbury has plenty of media attention, and so does Natalie Jeremy Jenkins, and so does Liam in various different places. Um, and I guess because if the architecture press wants to continue to ignore it, then that's their um, problem. <laughs> Any questions in the audience? If you just ask. Sure. Um, I guess it kind of glanced through the table of contents in your book. I haven't had a chance to look through it yet. And, but there are a lot of, sort of forward thinking practices like you, you showed today and uh, looking at new technologies or sort of networks, urbanism, like that at school. But then there were a couple other more uh, historic focus, or history focused uh, people. There's someone from Crimson, you know, uh, architecture historians, 
and there was someone from ARM, which really sort of literally sampled from history and insert, you know, like little set lot into a new museum or something. And I was just wondering what, how those historians fit into this idea of future practice, of what their view of yeah. future practice is. Um, well, in the case of ARM, I'm interested in them. Um, the interview with Steve Ashton from ARM is called the Contractual Innovator, and and what he's doing is um, he's he's effectively well, he's he's an architect, but he, but he focuses on the um, sort of contractual professional aspects of projects. So um, he writes new forms of agreements between builders, architects, clients, governments. Um, and they've had an incredible success story, a successful um, run in the history of delivering really complex buildings so that, you know, we know our architecture, it's kind of offensive in its um, baroqueness. But to deliver those kinds of buildings on time and on budget, and, and you know, for them it's all part of the package. You know, you, you're a professional, you need to. Um, you know, do really good architecture and you need to be really um, competent as a business person. And I was interested in it, that one of the key partners effectively manages that aspect of the, of the company, you know, creating new agreements to reduce the adversarial nature of, of um, architecture. And then, um, about to step out, so he, he's sort of the, described as the historian of the present. And, um, uh, I'm interested in what he does because he, um, he, well, on the one hand, he's the professor of design and politics in um, TU Delft, so he, he has this great understanding of the, of the history of architecture and its relationship to um, the welfare states. And much, much of the um, the uh, early history in, in, in this lecture is come out of that interview. Um, but he's also, you know, he's trained as a historian, but they they also um, do bids for um, public planning. So they've master planned whole suburbs in Rotterdam, um, commissioned architects and acted as clients and effectively as developers. So, so he's somebody who, um, and, and they, they basically underbid a um, commercial developer to develop an entire suburb by saying, don't tear anything down, um, just renovate the programming. So they built that um, fat, Building which is in Hoaxley, uh, which has the sort of cityscape on the top and the um, exploding doorway, and that's a sort of public event space and sports building. And they even programmed that for the first couple of years. So, that, so their their response to design is informed by what they would say is the, the lessons of history. You know, we and Martin would say that the. Um, Demolishing these um, social housing projects from the post-war is as megalomaniac as it was to build them in the first place. You know, we need to. It's too black and white. We we need to learn to adapt our buildings. We need to learn to um, you know retain the, the neighbourhoods which have developed in them um, and be more intelligent and specific about how we engage with um, with context. And, and I guess that's a lesson that he, he would say he's learned through history and through research. Do you know if they would actually present that historical research to the clients, to the developers they were working with, or would he just use it to make a compelling argument? Uh, yeah. Um, it's the, the relationship to their work as historians, I mean, they've all done PhDs individually on various Arctics, you know, famous old Dutch post-war Arctics. Um, and, and then on the other hand, they're actually involved in the, you know, what Bhatta calls the dark matter of the bureaucracy. So there's this, there's a relationship. I'll, I'll try, I could try and find a quote. I could show you after maybe. All right, maybe I can find it here. The, the um, uh, um, sorry, maybe I, I'll show you afterwards. The, the theory informs the development, and the development informs the theory. That's the idea, anyway. So that perhaps it's not used so much as leverage, but they become better historians by actually being involved in real process, and they become better developers by knowing the history. I think that's the that's how they would describe it. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just following the presentation, but um, I'm really interested in the idea of, of you, know, you sort of started. 
I mean, I think you probably the book talks about the shift in the architect's role and I guess the role of education in that. Because to me, in a way, when I was at university, and I think it's still present in a lot of uni, the design subject is the subject and the architect is, the good architect is the good designer. But, you know, you're one of the chapters about the contractual guide and to me, a lot of those chapters have the three roles, the design person, um, the front guy who does the sales and kind of often the ideas, and then the person who backs it up with business. And yet in, in the architecture school, we're not glorifying the, the front guy, the promotional guy, the, I mean, um, Mr. Big or whatever, who's up at one of these he's the front guy, I think, and not the design guy. So I was in Richard Rogers' office a couple weeks ago, and they were saying, oh, Rogers was the front guy, not the design guy. He's a design guy, he tucks under his wing and always gets a new one when he needs one. <laughs> but that's not really the role of the architect as we're seeing in university. It's just, if you're good at design, you could be a good architect. Whereas, to me, should the schools not be saying, right, well, we're going to have this incredible kick-ass business stream of architects and this great kind of promotional entrepreneurial stream of architects like the Marcus Westbrook might have done that course or, or Jeff might have done that course. Or, and then you have the design thing. And until, I think, we get over this idea of the modernist idea of the high designer as the high priest of architecture, we lost often isn't even good at the other stuff and ends up just doing houses, something like a little writing. You know, maybe we're stuck in this sort of self-perpetuating problem of being the irrelevant architect from out of school being, you know, the good ones don't get anywhere and you just have this occasional outburst of the stuck architect who's good at all three of them or a good team of three. What do you, what do you think? Well, just really briefly, I mean, I, I, first of all, I, I definitely agree that um, those roles of the architect are not ex accentuated in school at all. And in fact, are, I mean, even just by the sort of eye rolling re a reaction of people like Bjarke is lecture tonight, um, is, is a sign that that sort of like the, the showman is, is rejected in architecture culture. Um, but as far as the contractual side, I thought it was interesting. Um, this is just, just a, a quick aside. Um, there's an architect here in New York City who I, I, I won't want to defend architecturally, but was nonetheless very interesting on this contractual level. He's kind of like the, the Darth Vader of, of contractual innovation. Um, this guy, I think his name is Robert Scarano or something like that, but like, uh, he was disbanded from, uh, or just, he's no longer allowed to practice architecture in New York City. Um, but the reason why there's this fascinating article about it was that he would um, he, would, he, was, he was described as approaching uh, zoning code the way that uh, a Talmudic scholar would approach sort of a textual history. And he'd find all these tiny loopholes to be able to do these ridiculous things with um, having a, you know, expanded foyers and houses. Um, one, the one example that blew my mind was that um, somehow he did something, and I have to confess to ignorance about how this happened, but um, by hiding a bathroom behind drywall so that after the house was, was sold, he then told the couple, if you knock through that wall and, and knock through the drywall, you'll find a, another bathroom. Because <laughs> it was illegal to put the bathroom in the, in the, in the plant. Um, and so they were like, what? And so they went and they knocked and it was hollow and they punched through and there was a bathroom. But so anyway, so it's now illegal for this guy to practice in New York City. But so I, I, I use that simply as an example that, yeah, you know, like, uh, Really finding someone that can find those loopholes the way you hire a lawyer to go through uh, or an accountant to go through your taxes. Like, I mean, you know, the Mitt Romney example, like, if you can find anything possible to get a deduction, um, you certainly aren't taught that, at least not in the architecture departments that I've, I've been a part of. But it would be, it'd be really interesting to even just as a, as a speculative class, like, take this zoning code and find all the kind of Scarano like Talmudic moments where you can have these moments of hidden bathrooms or expanded foyers. And I think that even just as, as practice, that would be pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that this guy has st architect qualities. You know, I I support this kind of. Uh, <laughs> we just <laughs> <we've> see. <seen it. laughs> well, well, perhaps he just needs to have a designer under his wing. You know, I mean, the the, the idea that we put the designer always at the top, or or the, the front man who becomes the the top, I think is. Yeah, it's, it begins at, in first year, and, and, and perhaps we do need to, you know, set up various streams or mentorships for. I mean, I mean, I don't know any. Of, you know, I don't think Steve Ashton teaches or has ever been invited to teach. I mean, it would be great to, um, you know, get that kind of perspective. And I'm sure there's there's people in architecture schools who, who would gravitate towards that kind of thinking rather than, um, you know, competing to be the greatest designer all the time. The interesting thing for me, I worked in Melbourne and with ARM on some projects, but I was working as an urban designer in a planning firm. And in the planning firm, Steve Ashton was the man. You know, if you got ARM, you got Steve Ashton, he's the man, because he's the business guy. So they thought the design guy and the front guy were just irrelevant, because he was the business guy. And the same with Get Paul Marshall, and I imagine SKM was like, okay, that have work. But, so I think as architects, we can sort of remain irrelevant if we don't think of what the big society thinks of us, and they're interested in business. So we want really good business architects, you know. And I don't know, we all tend to, 
looking down a little bit like, oh, what's the thing this So um, I think we're condemning ourselves to this. We need to have a real bust out in future practice to, to switch out of this sort of increasing irrelevance. Really. Um, as a designer, I'd like to kind of come in and defend the design. So I'd say in terms of the education system, I mean, just graduated from Columbia and also from my mind for a while ago. Uh, I think there's a lot of things you can teach at architecture school, but you don't have so much time. And a great business person, a great functional practical person, those are things that you can learn outside of the field. And so within kind of the system, you have to learn the things that are intrinsic to architecture practice. And so the kind of conversation we're having today is um, part of what you're talking about is future practice that is somehow transformative to the field of architecture and kind of transgress it and kind of push it in different directions and maybe socially minded or futurist minded or kind of politically engaged. And part of what you're talking about is um, how architects can be more successful. And so how they can be kind of valuable and how we can survive and how that external value of the field can be quantified by external sources, by the business world. And so kind of what I'm more interested in is these um, practices that are somehow transformative. And I'm kind of like, I can't go past Bucky. Like, have, have any of the examples that you've presented that have gone past kind of, you know, Bucky's great quote that I can't quite remember, like, architect has to be part inventor, part activist, part this, part this, part this. But everything I've seen today is kind of still within that realm. Like, I haven't seen anything that's like really kind of pushed it and transformed kind of like the way to think about architecture. Yeah, I mean, the one example I would say is, is um, I mean, the, the model of Jeannie Gang as integrator. You know, I, I think, you know, even Bucky would, apart from Bucky, we haven't seen anybody with that kind of a incredible brain to encompass all the, what is it, the evolutionary economist or, you know, this, this kind of spectacular array of the future designer. Um, and I think we just need to augment that with the collective intelligence of a, of a team. So that's why we, these integrators become really important, people who can plug together the right kinds of um, expertise and experience to form that super person. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, perhaps it comes back to this idea that you know, as long as the designer is at the top, instead of the person who just... You yeah, know, I would change can design to like creative thinker, the lateral thinker. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I think that's kind of, that's the way I think. And, and design is going to be part of that, but it's going to be informed by, by sort of deeper um, understanding, and that might come from a more diverse team. I think that's right. Um, yeah, I, it seems to me that there exists this tension in the work that you presented between this sort of like very strictly classical modern ideal of like the architect who who makes the correct thing and the sort of like much more distributed sort of community-based architectural practice. Um, it seems to me that this history sort of proves one of those things wrong, i.e. modernism, like they did, you know, uh, you know, Corbusier's magic god hand photograph turns into the projects and everyone hates them and is scared of them and stuff, you know? Um, I, so I, I guess I, I wonder whether you feel that there is some ability to transcend that sort of like old narrative of the architect as prophet. Um, using, I mean, to my mind, the answer is like technology. Um, but also, I mean, like, again, the, the sort of, those open source sort of like building plans you're talking about right now. Um, and like those interesting like real estate practices to get people back in their buildings, you know, when they shouldn't be technically or whatever, financially. Um, yeah, I, I guess this, this tension with, with modernism for me um, is, we, you know, the, 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 the popped ambitions or the, or the um, bad reputation that Arctic's got after these failed social housing projects has made us retreat into various different, um, you know, we, we, the idea of doing something big is to, um, you know, we, we, we had the stick <laughs> cracked over our knuckles for doing that this, in the last century and we're, we're afraid to take on that, that scale again. And I think, I think we need to, re I'm saying we need to recapture some of that ambition, but in form of, in, in a more deeper way, I guess that's the, so it's, so, you know, we need to confront the idea of the modernist that we've thrown away. There's some useful parts in that, like being visionary, 
and there's some less useful parts in that, like being a megalomaniac. Uh, <laughs> I guess it seems to me like the central failure in harvest is that it didn't change the culture. You know, like at the end of the day, in order for real change to happen in our society, it's not going to be from the buildings we live in. It's going to be because the culture changes from one reason or another. And it seems to me that our buildings are really that way. And so I guess I'm skeptical of that same. Uh, I mean, I guess I'm just but like, it seems redundant. <laughs> Let's just take one, one more question and then um, and break. There's other one up in front or back. I'm sure if he wants to go first. Or jump off. One more question? Yeah. Let's do one. Do you want to do it? Uh, then you can go for it. Go for it. I mean, if you... Go for it. Well, I, I'm not, I have no architectural background whatsoever, so it's a really naive question. But from the demand side, are people coming to architects increasingly sort of thinking they already know what they want and know what's possible and all that kind of stuff because they have access to apps and stuff that maybe give them grand ideas or something? And, and um, are they coming to the individual architect or are they coming because they think all architects are the same? Or they come to the individual studio? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I guess the the kind of public's understanding of what architects do or can be, you know, what their services are, is it's shaped so much through media. And it, at the moment, the media treats architecture in a really simplistic way. I mean, it's either through lifestyle shows or through stuff like grand designs, which is just sort of, you know, luxury dream house type thing. Um, it's very poorly understood as being a discipline which can undertake strategic thinking or um, planning or in integrative stuff like we've been discussing. So I think that's right. I, I think, and the, and the sort of requests you get are along those lines. Um, you know, designing nice houses, I, I guess, is, the, is what people expect architects to be able to do. Um, and I think, yeah, so there's a bigger project to try and redefine our skill sets, which is yeah, uh, massive. <laughs> cool, thanks, Roy. Thank you, Jeff. If you're going to stick around, uh, you're going to have a glass of wine. Uh, definitely pick up a copy of the book if you can and uh, grab Roy for any other questions or, or comments or, or feedback. And, uh, thanks for coming.